This week on the podcast, we're speaking with Peter Cousins, author and historian of this book, Tecumseh and the Prophet. It's a great bookend to his earlier book, The Earth is Weeping. And if you're interested in learning more about American history, and particularly reintegrating indigenous and Native American stories into the American narrative, please check out the book in our show link. Thank you again, and enjoy the podcast. Um, but thank you again for chatting with me and taking the time out of your day. No, uh, my pleasure. But I've loved the book so far. I'm basically reading both Tecumseh and I'm also reading The Earth is Weeping sort of at the same time. And The Earth is Weeping has been on my reading list for so long. And I was blown away. I've got to say the introduction, I think, is one of the best introductions I've ever read in a history book. I think how you laid out the arguments for the entire book was amazing. And for someone like myself who came from a history master's with a specialization or focus in American history, you don't hear that perspective enough. And I was just, I was just so surprised by like, maybe what your journey was to writing um, The Earth is Weeping and that introduction. Like, I think it's just, I think should be like almost mandatory for most history students. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think maybe I, sometimes I think I might have an advantage in that I'm not a professional historian um <clears throat> i'm a you know i'm a for, former foreign service officer diplomat and, and um so i think maybe there's a tendency in academia i see it with a lot of academic historians to they they enter a project uh trying to prove a point mm-hmm. and they they don't let their research steer them to the conclusions, but on the contrary, they skew their research to um, reinforce conclusions that they may have already drawn. And mm-hmm. I, I can honestly say to the extent that anyone can be open-minded, I mean, we all have our, 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 our prejudices or our assumptions. Mm-hmm. I think I'm, I'm pretty good at, at, just, at just letting the story tell itself and then stepping back and trying to synthesize it and and again this introduction lay it out in the most objective way i can for readers and um you know the story is often is not what i expect it to be i'm and i'm often surprised in the course of a course of my writing and I, so i think i think that's uh, might be again might be an advantage of not being mm. a professional historian who's expected to make a you know expected to have a thesis and expected to prove it regardless of where the preponderance of, of, of uh, you know, the evidence might take them. Yeah, I was, I was really fascinated because that's something, I'm, I was sort of a Civil War buff during my time, like in my master's um, in American foreign policy. And that's just something which you don't hear a lot about, especially your arguments that there are different factions and alliances that sometimes have very reasonable incentives to uh, maybe oppose certain Indian forces or uh, native tribes. And that there's also uh, this not a monolithic understanding, at least at that time, of indigeneity or Native Americanness as this sort of all-encompassing thing, which is is fascinating, especially from my perspective. I also do a lot of research on the Middle East and the Jewish community, and a lot of people probably also um, project that onto the Jewish community, that it's sort of a one cohesive unit, but that you actually study it more, and you see that there's a lot of layers and factions and tension in there. Right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm aware my wife's Jewish, so I, I understand that. I mean, and they have this, uh, I mean, this, the, the fundamental Ashkenazi, yes. and, uh, you know. Yeah, and then you have the religious tensions on top of that. and the, right. yeah. yeah. So it's fascinating. And when you came into writing The Earth is Weeping, were you, did you come in with that knowledge, or was that sort of <laughs> all um, sort of a hot take when you were doing the research and learning on the way? I was pretty much researching and learning on the way. I mean, I, I, I um, and what what what, precede, what preconceived notions I had, often I found were in line with things that I discovered were untrue or were, were myths mm-hmm. about about the West. Um, and I, I came to the project uh, on the, because of a, a Civil War book that I'd written. I wrote a biography of a general uh, named John Pope, mm-hmm. who um, was defeated by Robert E. Lee, the second. Manassas and then sent out west to fight Indians. And you know, most histories, that's the last you hear of him. But actually, he went on to a very uh, successful career in the West. And at, by the, at the end of the Civil War, he was really the Army's leading expert on, on the Indian tribes of the Plains, uh, such as that expertise you know, was in the Army. But what really fascinated me that throwout his 20 uh, plus years on the frontier, 
that he espoused what I consider to be a very humane and forward-looking policy toward the Indians. He, re- he recognized that, uh, you know, whether it was government, uh, <clears throat> excuse my cough, government uh, lack of good faith uh, and, uh, cor- you know, corruption on the part of the Indian Bureau, uh, uh, encroaching, encroachment by, by illegal settlers that were that. To provoke the Indian Wars, and they, that the Native Americans were largely were largely blameless, uh, and um, that surprised me to see you know see a, a senior army official mm-hmm. speaking this way. And then I kind of as I dug deeper, I found that that was actually a prevailing sentiment among the army leadership, uh, not the exception. And mm-hmm. so that that's what initially sparked my my interest in, in the subject was, okay, what else don't I know about this period and mm-hmm. You know, as I progressed, of course, I discovered that the Indians were uh, far more um, uh, factionalized than I ever imagined, and uh, that there really was no sense of a you know Indianness or, or a cohesion among the tribes, and that it, it just was much much more complicated, and nuanced than I than I ever had imagined. Right, because John Pope's story, uh, part of the. Uh, reference to him is that really goes to show that one of your arguments was that there was never really a policy of genocide, which is a very common oracle point to make today. And it's very ironic to say is for Jewish communities, it's Yom HaShoah, which is the Remembrance Day. So it's very interesting because I feel it's a very politicized field of study. It's an important field of study. But unfortunately, I sometimes find that the rhetoric and buzzwords, if you throw out genocide, it's very hard to challenge that to have a... Because I remember... I was watching a discussion you were having at uh, some public event, and someone had asked you about that and about distinguishing between a genocide versus a cultural genocide and some of right. the insha and our nuances. And so I feel that's missing a lot of times in academia. If you throw out the G word, then that's sort of the end of the discussion. There's no uh, deeper right. angle to that. Exactly. It's, it's almost like if you try to challenge that in any respect, then you're a bad guy. I mean, you're it's not somehow you're advocating it. Mm-hmm. And the, of course, the definition of genocide, as you well know, has has uh, has changed exactly. dramatically since uh, the Holocaust. I mean, it's 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 encompasses more than than the, the annihilation of people. It, again, corpuses encompasses what we now call cultural genocide. And and um, I mean, in in modern terminology, there's no arguing that even the the greatest advocates of uh, Indian rights, so to speak, believe that, mm-hmm. and they would not. They would not have used the term genocide. They would not have been familiar with that, or, or even, you know, understood what 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 it meant in a cultural sense. Mm-hmm. But they, but they recognized, as did many many Indians themselves, that to ex- to exist and survive when they were so outnumbered. Uh, and you know, survive this, this white tidal wave mm-hmm. that they would have to assimilate to a greater or lesser extent. And um, like I say, even the greatest advocates of Indian rights believe that in order to survive, they had to become essentially had to become uh, um, farmers or, or cattlemen or mm-hmm. and, and really you know, civilized. In a sense of becoming Christianized, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was not a desire. There was a, on the part of of even of the military mm-hmm. or any but the most um, virulent fringe of exterminationists in the West to eliminate the Indians uh, physically. Mm-hmm. But the belief was that they either had to change or their way of life, or they would cease to exist. And uh, I mean, that of course today would be called cultural genocide. Um, but there was, of course, you know, there's a tragic inevitability to that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I make this point from time to time is that you take a tribe like the Cheyenne, uh, say the northern and southern Cheyenne, uh, maybe, I mean, at the time of which I write, the you know, numbers, of course, are uncertain, but maybe numbered 4,000 people uh, total, yet they claim is their, because they were nomadic people, they claimed is their land, their hunting grounds. Um, you know, northern Nebraska, uh, northwestern and western Kansas, eastern Colorado, southern Wyoming. And, and imagine, it, you know, in a country that was well over 40 million people by then, allowing 4,000 people to have as their exclusive domain the equivalent of a modern western state. That's just 
it's, it's of course it's, it's absurd and had nothing to do with whether they what their race was or ethnicity but <clears throat> that way of life was unsustainable unfortunately and I find this so fascinating because it's a very reasonable argument. Like whether people want to academically disagree on certain points, it's a very reasonable argument. And yet when I was in university, especially in history, like these are not perspectives that are heard. Like you are not on course syllabi. Like uh, I bury my heart on wounded, a wounded knee is a much more common, as you reference oftentimes, it's a much more popular perspective of looking at Indian wars and I guess Indian white relationships in uh, Canada and probably the United States as well. Do you, do you feel that that narrative or the needle has shifted at all with some of your research, or maybe people that you respect who do maybe non-academic writing on the subject? The perspective has shifted more toward my pers- well, yeah, perspective more, that I... Or at least to more of an opening up of the dialogue. Oh, d- definitely among uh, what I would call you know, popular historians, uh, non-academic historians. Uh, that's very much the case for people like Sam Gwynn mm-hmm. and uh, others who are Anton Sides and friends and, and colleagues who, are, who uh, I respect a great deal. That, that does exist um, among academic historians. I find almost uh, it's, it's almost uh, that it's moving in the contrary direction. That, that that they're digging in on this on this uh, notion that uh, well, in fact, I'm I'm, we're, I'm finishing up uh, my next book, which uh, the working title is uh, "Red Sticks and Old Hickory: Andrew Jackson, the Creeks, mm. and uh, the Brutal War for the American South," which will kind of round out the trilogy. Yeah. And uh, I was reading a book recently on uh, by an academic historian on the uh, Indian removal, mm-hmm. and um, the the author in question just in one sentence dismisses Jackson as an Indian hating. Uh, you know, genocidal, you know, whatever. Right. And, and you, you know, you can't you can't dismiss a person in one sentence like that. I mean, there's just too many nuances, too many. Ch- yeah. And um, so, I, I think that that uh, in academic history, that tendency is 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 not abating at all. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, and does it come from? And this is one of the questions I want to ask you about your <clears throat> kind of being non-academic, not purely academic, in the sense of having a foreign service career, having a life outside of academia. And that's something which is a strong criticism, even amongst professors and academics, is that very insular and very insulated from the outside world and from normal thoughts sometimes. Do you feel that that has given you a unique perspective, maybe in your professional life, or just being outside of that bubble to come and write um, work that a lot of people in academia might not publish? Yeah, I think I don't think I'm unique in, in that sense. I think, um, I mean, when you look at books that sell, history books that sell, uh, more often than not, they're written by, you know, folks like me uh, who've had, you know, other careers or, or journalists uh, who are, of course, trained to to look at things as objectively as possible. Um, and uh I mean, there are there's some outstanding academics who, who you know, who have like uh, Bill Brands, H.W. Brands, for instance, who had, you know, who are, have stepped out of that bubble and, and are able to tell a balanced story for a general audience instead of just, you know, fighting these uh, internecine battles within academia to try to get their points across. And um, uh, so I, I don't think I don't think I'm unique in that mm-hmm. sense, but I think. I think it's a good perspective that to have. Again, I'm coming to this out of a out of a love and a general, a gen, uh, genuine, I think, intellectual curiosity mm-hmm. uh, about the subject matter, and uh, I think an openness to mm-hmm. to uh, to where the story might lead me. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's apparent in your writing, and I think that a lot of people. I think that's why it resonates with a lot of people. And I was curious, I think for a lot of our readers, they're probably someone in my age demographic, they're probably more university educated, they're writers, they're thoughtful. What was what was your journey to writing and and books and everything? Like I feel that is such a I think particularly a very different industry today than it maybe it was when you first started, but what what would be your advice to people who sort of are interested in exploring that avenue? You know, it's it's. I started. Uh, fortunately, my my first book was published when I was relatively young, and uh, um, and I was able to get get it published uh, through the help of of someone who mm-hmm. 
knew someone at a publisher, you know, kind of almost sort of going in the back door and it was very successful. It was a book of the month club selection and so forth. So I, you know, I was fortunate in that regard. Uh, today, you know, if I were coming in fresh today, um, I would I would find it, um, I guess, a lot more intimidating uh, because of the, um, I don't want to say dearth of publishers, but the uh, fact that, you know, there, there are fewer publishing houses that, that, that there's consolidation going on and, and uh, which tends to limit opportunities to, 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 to break in. But uh, I mean, they, they still exist. Uh, and for anyone who, who you know, has um, a topic that, uh, that an editor finds is compelling fresh and of course saleable yeah. uh i have i have a, a former foreign service colleague i respect very much who's uh i i'm not i guess i shouldn't you know say what he works what he's working on specifically but it's it's a tremendous uh uh historical uh work uh that on um, a perspective of World War II that's never been treated before. And I think he's going to have great success mm -hmm. getting that published. He, again, not an academic. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 first, the first thing is, if you're publishing traditionally, is, is to get, get an agent. And that, that, uh, right. that, that can be difficult. Um, I think it's, I think that the ideal progression would be to get magazine articles published first to demonstrate uh, some you know some uh, degree of recognition in in journals and magazines that so that you have a uh, some um, some sense of uh, uh, you know, recognition and of, of uh, mm -hmm. in, in a field before you try to move to the book the book market were you always intent when you were working professionally? Did you always think at one point that you were going to return to writing and to long form writing, or was that something that sort of surprised you along the way? Yeah, it was. It's funny. I really, I, my the writing. I won't say it derailed my foreign service career, but it took it. It, it slowed it down. I my first book was published after I'd been in the foreign service just seven years, mm -hmm. and uh, I I was on a fast a fast track. I mean, very fast track in the foreign service, and after the first book was published, I realized that my true love, my avocation was not, I mean, it was not the foreign service. It was writing. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I still enjoyed my foreign service career, but basically I, I, I you know, I stuck with the foreign service uh, because it was a respect, very respectable <laughs> career and it paid the bills. And, uh, but I, and I, but I kept writing at the same time. Uh, sometimes I wonder how I managed to balance them. Um, but I, I knew that I, that my life calling was not foreign service, but was writing. And so, you know, I availed myself of the opportunity to retire mm -hmm. as early as I could, uh, at 55 and devote myself to writing entirely. And I, I've never regretted it. Never, never been happier. Did but, you ever have any uncertainty about the writing and the love for it? Like, was it a sort of a torturous journey or did you always know, like, I think for a lot of writers, especially myself, you have a little bit of writing momentum. You get some articles published and you face like a little bit of a setback. You're sort of like very much Joseph Campbell, like you're in the abyss and you eventually have to come out. Like, was that your journey or were you always sort of never doubted that this was the, the place that you wanted to be and the work that you wanted to do? Um, once, once I began, I mean, I've always enjoyed writing. I mean, even in, 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 in college, I mean, I enjoyed writing papers. I mean, I just, I, I enjoyed the process and, and, you know, I, I had the luxury of, of course, the foreign service career and the, and the you know, certainty of that. So that if a particular book didn't do as well as it might have, I wasn't like I was going to be, uh, be starving or anything. Right. And so that took a lot of pressure off, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, I, Fortunate that I, I, though I have not ever experienced deep writer's block, um, I, you know, there's been topics that I've pursued, uh, maybe spent even a, a, a year on researching, and then decided to drop. 
because somebody else published something on the same topic or I just realized it wasn't it wasn't going where I thought it was and uh you know I didn't let that just I don't want to sound too flippant it probably did <laughs> bum, but probably did bum me out at the time but I didn't let it stop me right you know, I just moved, moved on to another topic but uh and that's something you've got to be prepared for too is that you, know, you you may take on take something on and then realize partly through it well this, this maybe isn't what I thought it would be and then if you can you know have the ability to step back and start with something fresh and, and recognizing it because a particular subject uh, didn't work out it doesn't mean you you can't write you're not capable of producing good work. How did you balance the, now that you're talking about working and also researching, how was the research for some of these books? Because I imagine you must have gone to a lot of archives. I'm not sure if there were linguistic barriers. Like what was the research process like for maybe some of your favorite books? Well, um, it's been, it, frankly, research has beca- really has become a great deal easier with the internet. I mean, I, remarkably so having, for instance, my my book to come the profit, you know, um, and also even to a greater extent, uh, the book I'm just finishing uh, on the on the Creek War and Andrew Jackson. Um, a lot of the materials I need in the case of to come the profit, they were uh, held in British or Canadian or Canadian archives. I did a lot of work with the Canadian National Archives, a great deal of work, and. Um, Thanks to the, the great kindness of the Canadian archivists, I didn't have to go to the archives. I mean, they, you know, I was able to identify material from their online, from their catalog, and and for a nominal fee, they they they, they scanned everything for me. And that, would, of course, would be unthinkable twenty years ago, I mean, ten years ago. Right. And uh, so, a lot of the source material I need: archival materials, uh, old newspapers, which of course are great sources. You know, papers going back to the seventeen hundreds are all online now and so it's it's become a lot a lot easier mm-hmm. although it's still it's still very important when you can and where the sites still exist when you're writing history i think to actually go mm-hmm. and, and visit the ground um and i, I find that critical with, for, for instance with the earth is weeping because so many of the indian sites in the west exist exactly as they were at the time and it's it's it adds it's it's somewhat intangible but i i really do think it contributes to the sense of immediacy in your writing to have to have been at the location i mean you can you can describe terrain better you can just have just have a feeling feeling for you know what it was like and and as far as it's like linguistic barriers um in in my, my book i'm working on now I was able to, because I do speak, I speak fluent Spanish uh, from 20 years service in Latin America. I delve deeply into uh, Spanish archives from the uh, late 18th century, 19th century, dealing with their, with Spanish Florida. Uh, And that gave me a whole new perspective and and, uh, insights that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise if I had neglected those sources. Uh, but those, again, I was able to get those uh, without having to go to Sevilla uh, into the archives themselves because these things are online now. And that's just that's, right. that's a really, really remarkable uh, benefit. And now after this upcoming trilogy book that you're going to be releasing in the near future, is there any plans to move beyond the Civil War and Indian American history? Or do you have any plans moving forward? Uh, well, I see. Um, I mean, I once... And it's kind of a this a sense of trilogy that began sort of just chronologically backwards with the earth is weeping. What I want what I realized after I wrote that was that um, you know there there were uh, Indian wars a, a great moment and and maybe even a greater consequence east the Mississippi River mm-hmm. and um, so I, I wanted to incorporate the, the complete story of. United States conflicts with Native Americans as as the Republic moved westward, and and you know first and foremost that involved the, involves the modern Midwest and and uh, um, and parts of Canada, you know, um, and uh, ergo to come send the prophet, mm-hmm. and then I realized too that uh, you know the the, um, 
there are very important conflicts uh, in the American South, even the Creek without the, if the Americans had not prevailed in the Creek War, I think, uh, you know, the cotton, cotton kingdom would have been long delayed uh, um, or maybe even a stymie. Um, so, you know, I wanted to, to tell the story of, 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 as, as um, mm -hmm. fully as I could of all the conflicts the United States had with the Indians. But that, that was not my intention going into Earth is Weeping. It just kind of developed in the, the course well, of my writing. If you, if you don't mind me asking you for one last question, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but... No. What was the initial draw that you had to the Civil War and to the American West? Was it just you've always, for a, since you were like young, you always had a proclivity for that, or yeah, I mean, I, I, my interest in the American Civil War it, it began when I was a kid, uh, literally maybe in my early teens, yeah. you know, reading books uh, on the Civil War. Uh, I belonged to the Chicago Civil War Roundtable when I was 17 years old. I was, you know, the youngest member. Yeah. So that's it's all that interest has always been there. The American West was a little later in coming. Um, but you ask ask about my next project, and this is something that I haven't uh, um, uh, you know, formalized yet. But I'm very interested in doing a book on uh, uh, Deadwood. Mm. And uh, maybe a title, some, some, something to, on the lines of Deadwood, Gold Greed, and Gold Guns and Greed in the American West. And look at look at Deadwood in the Black Hills, mm -hmm. not not simply as a story of a, a very exciting and quintessential Western town, but also, you know, this, the the uh, the inter intertribal fighting for the Black Hills, the mm -hmm. the theft of the Black Hills, for lack of a better word, by the U.S. government. And then, of course, you know, the study of Deadwood itself and just try to tell a rousing good story. So mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I, that's and that I just go over my mm -hmm. my or my interest take me. I, I remember um, um, a uh, very distinguished historian saying once that um, um, he, you know, he uh, when he began a book, he usually knew almost nothing about the topic except that it interested him mm -hmm. and he felt that gave him a, you know a, a un uniquely fresh perspective in tackling it yeah and i just i just kind of try to go where my mm -hmm. my, my interests take me that's amazing i think there will be a lot of readers that will follow you wherever they take you um but thank you so much i don't want to take up too much of your time but uh this has been amazing mr cousins and i would love to stay in touch and uh hopefully when you oh, absolutely Building. Absolutely. And I just wish, you know, we weren't in COVID because I would, um, it's, it's robbed me of opportunities, of course, to do, uh, give book talks in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, Canada plays such an important role in the story of Tecumseh and his brother. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, it's funny, you know, I, I came out of the book cheering for the British in the War of 1812 <laughs> and realizing that we were the, absolutely the aggressors and I was just hoping the British would win and uh, and give Tecumseh and his brother a homeland. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, again, you keep an open mind. It's funny how your perspectives can change in the course of writing. Yeah, that is the Canadians' one claim to fame, 1812 and burning the White House. That's I think that's maybe the only thing that most Canadians know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... I wouldn't have objected too much if they burned it uh, during the course of the past four years. <laughs> but a little political side there. Yeah. But, but no. thank you so much, Ari. Thank you, Mr. Cousins, so much. And the book is amazing. Really, really, really cannot underscore how I think I, I really think that introduction that you wrote for The Earth is Weeping should be uh, like required reading. For any history class, because just it's um, narrative shifting, it just tries to challenge whatever the prevailing discourse is, and I think it's just a great historiographical tool that people should consult. So I'm I really appreciate it. One. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Cousins. Have a great day. Hey, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.